The sermon title this morning is Who God Prefers. That's maybe a, a weird title, and it's going to be seemingly a weirder answer to start with. Who does God prefer? God prefers losers. Okay? Now that's really going to sound strange for us uh, for a while. Uh, it almost sounds un American, doesn't it? Okay? That God wants losers. Because that's not the way we're brought up here in America. We think of, of different quotes like from General George Patton that said, Americans love a winner. America will not tolerate a loser. Or Coach Vince Lombardi, he says, show me a good loser and I'll show you a loser. Okay? Because uh, that's not the way we think in, in many aspects. Yeah, of course, in, in war, uh, you shouldn't think that way. And of course, when it comes to sporting events, we do look at, at winning. That basically we want to be on the winning team. As we are in this time in America because of college basketball, it's called March Madness. And so a lot of people have their brackets. I'm not doing too bad with my brackets, okay? Uh, when you have your main team doesn't even make it in, you don't have to have any bias at that point. You just go with brackets from that point on. But basically, as we go through those brackets, Shally has hers filled out. I have mine. And so we've been watching uh, some basketball. I haven't watched a one game through the whole year probably. Uh, but at this time, when it comes to the winners, I want to watch them. I want to see what, what's taken place. And some of the games... Eh, I'll watch for a little bit, and that's not a game that I need to see. Uh, but some of them are really good, really good. And you're there rooting for the winning team. Even though it may not be your team normally, but this is the one you want to win to, to keep going on and on and on. That we are there for. It's the same way with, with college football. One of the best rivalries that was there for years and years until Missouri, we stepped out of the Big 12, was Missouri and Kansas. Great rivalry. Uh, one of the longest rivalries. And, and just was so neat to watch. But there's others. Alabama and Auburn. We see Florida, Florida State. And that's two for me. I wish they both could lose. But, you know... Uh, <laughs> One's got to win. Ohio State, Michigan. There's a lot of those neat rivalries that, that take place. Jim Tressel was the uh, coach for Ohio State uh, for about 10 years. Uh, a winning uh, football coach. Uh, he was a, a winning coach when he was at Youngstown State as well as at Ohio State. And he wrote a book. It's called The, the Winner's Manual. And it, it's kind of a neat little book. And in one of the chapters that's entitled Handling Adversity and Success, he gives a quote from Bill Gates uh, from the, the whole Microsoft uh, aspect. And so Bill Gates said this, success is a lousy teacher. It makes smart people think they can't lose. Kind of a neat quote. Then the coach goes on from there. He says, I love that quote. Because it puts so many things in perspective. When smart people think they can't lose, there's an upset brewing. That's when David beats Goliath and the underdog triumphs. Pretty good thought there. See, that's the problem with winners. That's the problem if we just see that we have won and that's the way it's always going to be, that we can't lose, that we feel invincible within life, we are probably getting pretty close to becoming a loser, okay? And some people, after winning and then they lose, they never overcome that. They can't get over that, that whole aspect. And so we have to be careful because there's all these things in it. So when I say God prefers losers... It's the whole aspect, God prefers people that understand who they are. That they understand they have weaknesses, as we all do. They understand their flaws. They admit their mistakes and they cry out for God's help. That's a pretty good type of loser. See, God specializes in taking those that are weak, as all people are, and displaying his power through them 
in so many different ways. When you look at a lot of the Bible heroes that we, we read about, we study about, those in the Bible, we see some of them had ongoing flaws and weaknesses. Others, there were times that we see that. Sometimes it's sin, which the main word for sin is to, to miss the mark. That they, they miss the mark of where they should be. They miss the mark of God's glory. And we see that they're just ordinary people. That God was able to do some spectacular things, sometimes a lot of things through their life, sometimes one big event because they saw their flaws and they were able to be used. But they had their flaws. You, you look at God's roll call in the Old Testament. We, we read about Noah, the great things of Noah, but also we read that he got drunk too, okay? Abraham lied about his wife. Sarah laughed at God, okay? Uh, Jacob was a deceiver. Moses was a murderer. Uh, Rahab was a, a prostitute. Gideon was fearful. Samson had serious problem with lust and anger both. Uh, we see Eli failed as a father, and he was the high priest. We see David was an adulterer and a murderer. Sol Solomon married foreign wives and turned his heart towards idolatry. Elijah struggled with depression. Jonah ran away from God. Peter denied Christ. And all the apostles argued about who's the greatest, okay? It's got to be me. It's got to be me. And so as we see there, that's just a partial list of really the roll call. And we see they were flawed people. Ordinary people, you might say. But God was able to work through their lives and do great thing, things, not just for them, but so often for all people. And many of those things that we are still receiving benefits from. In 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4 and verse 7 is where I want us to start this morning, is a, is a verse that is just pretty neat to help us to see how God works through people and really who we as people are. That verse says, we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that his all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We have this treasure in jars of clay. I want us to, to concentrate upon that or camp on that this morning and look at what is Paul telling us about God? God giving this treasure through jars of clay so that God's power can be seen. And so we're going to go and look at a little bit more of this text instead of just verse 7 to see what this treasure is and what does it mean as the Apostle Paul is relating this. He says as we start with verse 1, Therefore, since through God's mercy, we have this ministry, we do, not, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we dishonor the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let, let light shine out of darkness, make his light shine in our hearts, to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. So that's kind of the context around that, that God has given a great gift. And as Paul is saying about himself, the gift isn't me. We that preach the gospel, it's not about us. It's a gospel about what God has done through the Lord Jesus Christ. And that God can use his power even through us. It's not our power. It's not because we are great, but it's because we have a great God. And so as we, we look at this, it says the gospel of Christ is a treasure for us to possess. 
Just think about it. And some of those things are on the screen. When we think about the great treasure the gospel is. Because if we receive the gospel, I am forgiven and God has removed my debts. I am justified and God has changed my state. I am regenerated, God uh, transforms my heart. I am reconciled, God has become my friend. I am adopted, God has changed my family. I am redeemed, God has changed my ownership. I am sanctified, God has changed my behavior. As we think about the great gift the gospel is, it is a treasure and we see that we are rich because of it. There's other aspects that we look at as riches here upon this earth. We can have a lot of money in the bank or we can have very little money, but this doesn't matter with this treasure. We may have a lot of material things or no material things, but this treasure is the real treasure. It is the treasure that matters the most. Because as we look at that list, all these aspects, these are eternal aspects, things that moth and rust can't take away, that we can't mishandle in, in such a way that it, it just all disappears from us. But we can keep walking and receiving all these that God has given to us. So how do we come to possess this treasure? the treasure that is the gospel. In verse 4 that I read, it tells us that to unbelievers, Satan tries to keep them blind. Okay? Satan does not want people to receive the treasure of the gospel. And so he uses darkness to keep people blind. That is what he tries to do. In whatever way he can, through our desires, through our lust, whatever way, trying to keep darkness there so that we cannot see the great treasure. But in verse 6, it said that God has made his light shine within our hearts. So even though Satan works very hard in this fallen world to have evil to be what is dominant, God's light still shines. And his, his light will shine beyond the darkness, beyond the veil, and come into our hearts. See, so God, in other words, is where the treasure comes from. It's not a treasure that we manufacture, and that's what Paul says. It's not our gospel, but it is God's gospel is what we preach. It comes from God. So it comes from God as we open ourselves to receive it. And we receive it because of God's grace. As we looked at that list of people that God used, it's not because they were so great and righteous on their own. The righteousness came as they gave their self to God, and it is God's righteousness that's shown through their lives. And so it is through God's grace. Without God's grace, we don't have hope. But with it, we receive the great treasure of the gospel. God also, it says, hides his treasure in jars of clay. Kind of weird words there. One of the things that I like to do on Monday nights when I am at home, at 7 o'clock, and if I'm really lucky on PBS, it's at 7 o'clock, and then also there's another episode at 8 o'clock, is Antiques Roadshow. I love watching Antiques Roadshow. Some of those I have seen before. I still act excited when I find out their junk is worth something. But I, I really enjoy watching that. And maybe it's because of my heritage. My granddad Conklin was one of those that went to all the auctions that he could possibly go to. Uh, it took uh, two auctioneers uh, two days to take care of the stuff at his house. And the stuff from inside the house, it was another day of auctions for, for all that, that stuff. But also, it's not that granddad always bought good stuff. He was the guy that when the auctioneer couldn't get a bid, they just looked, hey, conk, will you, will you give a buck for that? And so he took all this junk home. And so a lot of it, 
uh, when he was having the auction, which it was before he, he passed away, uh, the family would have to catch him sometimes at the other side of the property and they would burn a lot of stuff, okay? Big burn pile. So it, it just kind of passed uh, to, to me. My dad has a big shed that's so full of stuff that he recently had to, to build another shed just to put all his uh, old antique tractors in. And it's clear full. You can't put another one in there. So it kind of comes to me kind of naturally. But I love to see those knickknacks on the Antiques Roadshow. Uh, there was one of those that it, somebody had this ugly ceramic clown, okay? And it was one of those things, you don't know if they brought it for a joke or whatever. But when the appraisers looked at it, they said, oh, this is, this is kind of special. Uh, this is from the 1820s. The guy that uh, made this, he lived right outside of Warsaw, Poland. And eventually he came to America and he just made a very few of those. And so they always say, well, how much did you pay for it? And so they said, well, I think I paid 18 bucks. And you're wondering, why would you pay 18 bucks for this thing anyway? But lo and behold, it's worth about $45,000, okay? And you go, wow, that's, that's pretty cool when that, that takes place. And you see sometimes this old ugly vase, and you find out because now what it's worth is this vase, okay? It, it's a vase now. Uh, something that was worth 18 bucks is now 20,000. Uh, it, it's a whole different thing. And then people say, well, I'm not going to keep it in the closet or down in the basement anymore. I'm going to have to take a lot more uh, care of it. Sometimes those great treasures come from pretty ordinary things. It's just sometimes those things that, well, maybe your grandparents just kind of had in the house. Or maybe your parents had in the house and lo and behold, it was worth a lot of money. And that's kind of the way those things take place. Back in 1947, there was a Bedouin shepherd. He was just watching his sheep, and you can imagine in that area where he was, in, in that part of, of kind of Israel within that area by the Dead Sea, uh, it would be quite boring doing anything. Okay, there's nothing there. I'm not sure what sheep would even eat in, the, in that area. But he was there taking care of the sheep and he just start, started throwing rocks. Up There was a lot of caves. And so he was throwing and this one landed good and he heard something break inside the cave. So he went to investigate and he found some old, old clay jars in there. And inside he found there was some old manuscripts. And so he started looking at, in some other caves and he found some more of these old manuscripts. He couldn't read it. He saw it was probably worth something because they had to be old. So he went and sold the ones he had for $29. Now, for most of us, it's been long enough, we know those are the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, these are parts of the Bible that predate some of the manuscripts we had before by a thousand years. Okay? There are almost copies of Isaiah that was written at the time of Isaiah. It, it, it does a lot for us because a lot of skeptics of Scripture said before that everything was written after it happened, not after the Dead Sea Scrolls because these things were written as prophecy way before they ever happened. These are worth so much that is, they're, you might say, priceless. Probably they could be sold if they were in a possibility of being sold, but basically they're priceless. What he found and sold for 29 bucks in some old earthen jars are priceless. Clay pots. That's the idea of what Paul is talking about here. But we have this treasure, which is the gospel, in jars of clay, which is us, to show that the all-surpassing power of, of God. How, how important that is. The, the surpassing power of God. He works through us just as, as jars of clay. The jars of clay are just ordinary earthenware that people at the time would use, kind of like we would think of a, you know, a, a mason jar. You know, you just put stuff in it. You're canning, they would have put oil, or maybe they would uh, have grain in these things. Just things they would use each and every day. And that's what Paul is talking about. 
It's, he's not saying that God could only use the, 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 the vase from the Ming dynasty. No. He can use everybody. Just ordinary people that understand they have flaws and that they will reach out and ask God for help. Just clay pots. There's two things about clay pots we would know for sure. They're fragile. And also they're easily broken. Easily broken. And that's us folks. See, the ones that God used the best are the ones that know their limits. Oh, we have people that sometimes look down upon Christianity and say, yeah, they're losers, okay? They're just weak people that they, they have to have a crutch. I'd say far from it. We're people that are honest with life. Because we all see there's limits. Just like with this physical body, we know it's not going to be here forever. Uh, we know that no matter how long, maybe we've had just excellent health our whole life, it can change just like that. Okay. No matter how you took care of yourself, it can change. There's things happen in our lives. We can have loved ones pass away and, and just a crush that takes place within our lives. We know that this life is bigger than we are. That's why there's a Savior and a Lord. And so the whole reality is understanding that, that life is bigger than us, but we have the one that will help us through life. And he will work through ordinary people. He will work through anyone that allows that to take place. Because see, there's things that we just can't handle. There's things that we just can't stand up against. But God will work through us. What did God make the first man of? Dust of the earth, right? And all of us from that uh, point, from that point on, we have been made from the same clay, you might say. Right? We, in God's creation, he helps us see we're jars of clay, even through his own creation. But God hides or he places his gospel, the great treasure within us, to keep it, but also to take it to others, even though we're fragile. Even though we're fragile. Even though we fall short. And like sometimes with those heroes we see in the Old Testament, sometimes we can mess up. But he still trusts the great treasure to us. He places that inside of us. Just like he did then, he is still doing today with God's purposes in mind. So the gospel is a treasure. God hides his treasure in jars of clay. And he does it to demonstrate the source of spiritual power. In verse 7, that word power is used. Translators translate it a lot of different ways. Because remember, our English Bibles had to be translated. There's nothing wrong with translating, okay? Because originally most of it was in Hebrew, the Old Testament. The, the, the New Testament, Matthew was in Aramaic. The rest was in Greek. So it has to be translated or we need to know Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek very well. And so when they translate it, sometimes there's a lot of ways you can translate things accurately. So sometimes that word power is uh, talked about is his surpassing greatness. Uh, sometimes it's this extraordinary power. Sometimes it's this transcendent power or this splendid power. All those are, are very good translations for the word that we have in the Greek dunamis where we get our word dynamite. That's the power, this splendid, this big force that is there, this force that comes from God, that he has given us the treasure, which is the gospel. He's placed it inside of us, but this power is to demonstrate who he is, or else we would not be so fragile. God could have created us not to be fragile, or he could use a few of those that have seen that are less fragile. But no, it's for all of us. It's to show his great power. God's done that a lot of times in a lot of ways. Back in Judges chapter 7, we have the story of Gideon. Gideon is one of the judges. And as you look at the story there, Gideon is hiding out, threshing some grain in a wine press, hopefully so the Midianites won't see him there and come and steal everything he has. And God comes to him. 
and calls him to be a judge for the land, to break the back of the, the Midianites. And Gideon comes up with all sorts of things, said, not me. Our tribe is the smallest tribe. My family is the, uh, of people of no importance. And of all of my tribe and all my family, I'm the least important of all them, okay? He's saying what? I'm a fragile clay pot, right? But God was going to do something, not to show how great Gideon was, but to show how great God's power was and is. And so he told Gideon to get an army together. And, and it was going to, at least in Gideon's eyes, needed to be a pretty good sized army because the, the Midianites were going, going to have 135,000 soldiers come against them. So he got basically all the men in the land and they came up with 32,000. Four to one odds, not in the direction you want odds to go, okay? But God says, this is too big of an army. And so you can imagine some of that conversation. No, God, I said, we have 32,000. They have 135,000. Yeah, I think God heard, but that's too big. And so he gave a lot of ways to, to just start having the army get smaller. The first way is anybody that doesn't want to fight, go home. Okay, <sighs> okay, there's a whole bunch of them disappear. So eventually they come down to 300. 300 men that aren't warriors to fight 135,000. 450 to one, okay? Not the odds that you want if it was being fought through human sources. And so it's time, but God said, here's the plan. That when they're changing the guards at night, when most of the Midianites are asleep, I want you to get up on the hillside and you're gonna divide up. Some are going to blow trumpets. Some are going to light a torch. And the others are, are going to shout at that time. And they will shout, the sword of the Lord is, the sword is for the Lord and for Gideon. And so when the guards changed at the right time, the trumpets blew. There was also the, the torches that lit. And also there was the shout that took place. And then, because the Midianites were asleep, they are so startled, they start killing each other, okay? Pretty good way to take, take out a whole bunch of them. And that, that day, through 300 men, an army of 135,000 was beat. Who got the praise? Was it the 300? Was it Gideon? Or was it so obvious that it had to be God? Right? It was so obvious that God worked through those clay pots, those fragile people, but he showed his power. And he showed his power more than just to Israel. Don't you think the power was showed to the Midian as well and to other places? The power of the Lord God. When God wants to win a victory, he can use the fragile Okay, he can come to this earth as a baby and he's still going to have the victory. Because when the power of God is shown, you know, the, the, the power is going to be there. It's going to, God wants people to know where the source is. He doesn't want it to people to think it's from us because we don't have the ability to save and to lead. But we have the ability to receive the, the gospel and to share it. So others can receive that power. Billy Graham passed away last year. And for a long, long time, a lot of good books were written about Billy Graham, a lot of good things said about him. But part of it was, what was his secret for a fruitful life? Okay, when you, you think about it, was his sermons so unique that that's where the strength was? I don't think so. They were good, simple, sharing the gospel, okay? They were good. Was it from his intellect? No, not saying he wasn't smart, but it wasn't from his intellect by any aspect. Was it his natural gifts? No, he was just a boy that grew up in North Carolina, okay? That basically someone wrote this. 
Here's the answer. God used Billy Graham because he knew he could trust him with his glory. Billy wouldn't try to claim it for himself. To me, that sums up Billy Graham really well. That he became known all around the world and having some of those crusades that were unbelievable. How many people came and how many people responded uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ. And it was quite obvious that God was working within it. And I think we can say that about Billy Graham. He set up a whole bunch of things so Billy never thought himself that it's because of me. Having a good group that he worked with. Accountability in all things so that God's power could show in the things that that God wanted to take place. And then he was just willing to be used. James Denny, a professor from Scotland, says, there always have been men in the world so clever that God could make no use of them. I think that's true. True at all times. I think it's true today. That there are some people that just believe they are so clever that they will never see there's an aspect that they need to reach out to God. That they're self-sufficient. So sufficient that there's no need for God. Let's end with this thought this morning. See, God uses, if I can get a change. God uses broken, fallible, and very weak people because that's all he's got to work with. Who has not sinned? Who has not had burdens that we carry in life that are things that we can't make go away? See, that's all there is. And do we feel the sense of our weakness and cry out to God for help? And we need to take this to heart and be glad that that he will give us the great treasure. Okay? That even though we know we are feeble, even though we know that we are weak in, in ways, but God's army is an imperfect army. But we have a perfect God. That his power can do all that he wants to be done. And all that we'll do. And when the, the, the shout and the trumpet blows, and when we see that the last judgment will be here, it will be here because God has the power to do so. Because God says it's time. And may we be those earthen vessels that understand who we are. We're not God. We are made by God. We are important to God because he is our creator. He is our redeemer. He wants us and he will redeem us. And how neat that is. And so the church, you might say, as we work, we work together, we're the march of the unqualified. Right? We're the unqualified. But yet God has placed his power within us through the gospel, this great treasure for us to keep that treasure going out to others, to show his great power he can work through us to do great things. So we need to get in line And we need to join the rest of the clay pots of God and see what he can do through us. Great things in you, through you, and for others.